All right, so let's continue then with our discussions of the corrosive materials and just a little bit of review from where we were on Friday, just kind of how we closed up. Um, most of our discussion uh, was about the critical thinking assignment Friday. Let's kind of close this up just reviewing a little bit of acid base property. So we know that acids and bases react with each other. They call we call those neutralization reactions. Those neutralization reactions are double replacement. And those double replacement reactions will always give us some kind of salt, ionic compound, and water. Now, as far as acids are concerned, we did discuss acids and litmus paper, bases in litmus paper. Remember, litmus paper comes in two different forms, red and blue. Um, and litmus paper will either turn red or it'll turn blue. Or it'll say exactly as it is. So when something is in the presence of an acid, all the litmus paper is red. The red litmus paper stays red. The blue litmus paper turns red. In the presence of bases, all the litmus paper is blue. Blue paper stays blue. Red paper turns blue. And we also talked about where acids and bases come from, the anhydrides. And the anhydrides themselves are basically acids and bases without water. So if I take a basic substance, extract out the water, I'd be left with some sort of metallic oxide. That metallic oxide would have basic characteristics to it if we added water. So something like magnesium oxide, if I put it in the presence of water, would turn it into magnesium hydroxide, which is a phase. If I have a non-metallic oxide, something like sulfur trioxide, and I put it in the presence of water, it will end up giving me an acid substance, in this case, sulfuric acid. So the big takeaway out of this particular concept is that if I have a substance that is one element with oxygen, I can determine its acidic or basic character based upon whether or not it is a metallic oxide or a non-metallic oxide. Metallic oxides are gonna form bases. Non-metallic oxides are gonna form acids. And that's really as, as easy and simple as it gets. Now, the chemical formulas of some of these compounds, these oxides, can be insane especially on the non-metallic side. Things like P2O5 and N2O3, which make nitric acid and phosphoric acid. On the metallic side, they tend to be a little more straightforward because the hydroxides that we're making and the oxides that they came from are ionic compounds. And so they're based on charges and we can't deviate too significantly from the charges of the metals that we predict on the periodic table. And oxygen is always going to be a negative two charge. So there isn't a whole lot of movement there. But let's get into the actual action of these substances. Now, as corrosive agents, Acids can act as corrosive materials on a variety of surfaces. They can act as corrosive materials on metals. They can act on corrosive materials on metallic oxides. They can act on metallic carbonates. And they can act on human skin tissue. 
All four of those things are things that acids can react with. Bases, on the other hand, their reactivity is a lot more limited. They can react with metals, but we need to put a side note here. The metals that they can actually react with are relatively limited. There's only two, maybe three examples of metals that will consistently react with strong quantities of base. They don't react with oxides, they don't react with carbonates, but they do react with your skin tissue, but in a very different way than acids do. So of these two categories, the acids are by far the more dangerous substance. They're the far the more corrosive substance, the far more hazardous substance because of the wide variety of materials that they can react with. That doesn't mean bases aren't dangerous, but it does mean that they have a much more limited scope of hazard compared to acids. When it comes to reactions of acids with metal, we're going to find that most solutions of acid will react with most metal compounds. The only ones that we do not find reaction with are things like copper, silver, gold, and mercury. You can also throw platinum and palladium into this list as well. These are what are known as the inert metals. And these inert metals um, really don't react with much of anything unless the circumstances are much more extreme. These metals have very low reactivities, which is also why they're very common either building materials or jewelry materials. They're going to be on your person. You want them to be very corrosion resistant um, because your body excretes oils and sweat and things that can be a real great playground for corrosive attack. That's why we make our jewelry out of gold and out of silver and not out of iron. Iron may be a little bit more scratch resistant, especially in the form of certain kinds of steel, but in terms of its corrodibility, not so great. For this reason, we cannot store acids in metal containers. We have to store them in either glass or some sort of plastic packaging. If it is stored in a metal container, that metal container has to have a rubber bladder in it. The bladder system inside of it is to protect the metal from corrosive attack. Again, the only reason we really do that is if we were storing and shipping really large quantities of something, like say on a rail car. Um, and if you've seen half of the trains that run through town, a good number of them contain sulfuric acid. Um, sulfuric acid goes along the rail lines through town often. Um, and when it does, those are metal train cars. They have some sort of bladder system in them so that the sulfuric acid doesn't just eat through the train car. Sulfuric acid in particular is used in a lot of industrial processes. Uh, so pretty much any materials supplier is going to use sulfuric acid in some kind of a way. Um, in its production and purification process. Mining is going to use it to a good significant portion, not necessarily coal mining, um, but if there's any kind of metallic mining going on, um, high concentration acids are used to basically strip out the metal from the other parts of the rock. 
and then they can use uh, another series of chemical processes to get the metal out of the or out of that solution. Of it. With metallic oxides, again, remember metallic oxides are basically in hydrides. So they will act as bases act. You're going to get basically a neutralization reaction going on. And as I mentioned with neutralization metal reactions, we get a salt and we get water. Most common process here, um, going back to what Chris's question was, is pickling. Um, not pickling in the food storage kind of sense, where we would pickle meat or vegetables or um, eggs or something along those lines, but rather an industrial process where we can extract metal out of rock by getting the rock to dissolve in a high concentration acid. Most of the components of the rock aren't going to dissolve, but the parts that do are usually metallic in some kind of a way, and we can do some other processes to, to take out the metal. Common pickling liquids would be sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, or phosphoric acid. The second chemical example of a reaction with acid with a substance is the metallic carbonate. Uh, metallic carbonates are also basic like structures. So these aren't basic anhydrides, but they are solids with basic properties. So if we dissolve them with water, they will uh, raise the pH above seven, but they don't have a distinguishable hydroxide on them. And they don't turn into hydroxides when we put them into water. But what we'll see in these kinds of cases is if I put hydrochloric acid in the presence of one of these carbonates, it's still a double replacement reaction. The product that we would expect of that double replacement reaction is something called carbonic acid. And carbonic acid does not actually exist in solution. Um, what happens to it is it will decompose spontaneously into the water that we would expect and a carbon dioxide byproduct. And so if you are familiar at all with that class of demonstration reactions that you probably a good portion of your elementary school experience, baking soda and vinegar. This is that kind of reaction. Basically, baking soda, baking soda is a carbonate. Um, it's sodium hydrogen carbonate. And when you encounter it with vinegar, which is acetic acid, you get this kind of a reaction that takes place. The only difference is that you get the highest you get the carbon dioxide, that's what blows up the bubble, that's what makes the volcano explode. But instead of sodium chloride, you get sodium acetate, which is also dissolvable in water because of the vinegar. Vinegar will give you acetate ions instead of chloride ions when it reacts. But these kinds of reactions where we're most familiar with them is um, those kinds of science demonstration experiments, the, the classic science fair volcano, um, the, uh, any, any of the baking soda and vinegar kinds of experiments that you might have seen when you were in elementary school. 
when acids react with skin tissue, um, there is a corrosive effect that is caused by this exposure. But how much of an effect that we see really depends upon a couple of things. It depends on the length of exposure and it depends on the concentration of the acid. If we have an acid that is diluted with water, the effects of this can be very, very mild. It can range from little things like skin itching or getting a little red welt where the contact was made. If you're exposed to nitric acid, that nitric acid can actually turn your skin fingertips yellow as a result of the nitrogen dioxide that's forming off of the oxidation process. Now I'll tell you, anyone who does any significant work in a chemistry lab is probably gonna end up with yellow fingers at some point in time. Happens to pretty much all of my Gen Chem 1 and Gen Chem 2 students, especially the ones that don't wear gloves consistently. Just little yellow marks and I mean, doesn't hurt, uh, especially if you have a low level exposure, but the yellow skin can remain for a couple of weeks uh, because basically you have to, the skin has been permanently dyed, so to speak, you can't wash it off. You have to basically wait until your skin sheds, you change, you change it out. At higher concentrations, you can get skin blistering. You can actually get uh, effects that are almost more like um, more like a second degree burn kind of look. With prolonged exposure and high concentration, you can get very, very serious skin damage, permanent disfigurement, um, scarring. So again, it comes down to both factors. Short-term effects can be relatively mild. Long-term high dose exposure can really be painful and potentially disfiguring. This is why most concentrated acids have some sort of glove shield kind of requirement depending upon the nature of the acid. For some of those acids, simple nitrile gloves are good enough. For oxidizing acids like nitric, um, vinyl gloves are actually recommended um, because they give you a little bit more corrosion protection. Um, but generally, if you're using high concentration acids, you want to put something between you and those, and those uh, acids. Bases. There are three common metals that bases will react with. Aluminum, zinc, and lead. End of list. So one of the things we see with bases is that the reactivity range is not nearly as large as it was for the acids. And what that really means for us is that storage of these bases is actually a lot easier. In fact, it can be really easy because most of the bases actually exist in solid form as anhydrides. So what do we do? We just keep them in their solid form, transport them as solids, make up the amount of base that we need at the right time, as opposed to having to carry around large quantities of liquid because that's really the only way that the acid exists. So aluminum, zinc, lead, those are the only three metals. When it comes to reactions with skin tissue, again, it's the same thing. Concentration and duration make a difference. And in terms of what you see, 
also kind of the same thing. For low concentration, short exposures, you might see a little bit of a reddening of the skin where you do contact with the base. Beyond that, not a whole lot if the concentration is super low. With higher concentrations, you can get a change in the texture of your skin, where your skin kind of takes on a soapy, sticky, soft consistency. In very low levels, if you were to take a concentrated base and just pour it on your fingers and kind of rub it there, you would feel that slipperiness. It would feel soapy. And the reason for that is that that reaction is starting to take place. And if you wash your hands really, really fast, it doesn't make any kind of lasting or even noticeable damage. That's what... That's how bases react with your skin. Your skin surfaces have fats on them, oils. And your and bases will react with that. And initially, the reaction is going to be very soap-like. Remember when we talked about fires? We talked about kitchen fires and how they would pour base solution on kitchen fires in industrial kitchens to put out grease fires. And the reason they did that was because it would create a soap kind of consistency. It's the same thing here that happens on your skin. And if your exposure is incredibly short, less than 20, 30 seconds, you're not going to see any kind of lasting or even noticeable effects. But if it's there for a long period of time, it can start to make damaging marks on your skin. And with extremely long exposure, it can definitely change the nature of your skin, make it dark and leathery, give you very deep wounds that are tough to heal, irreversibly damage your skin tissue, lead to permanent scarring, permanent disfigurement, in very, very, very high concentration and very, very long procedures. The more concentrated the solution is, the faster these kinds of effects take hold. In the cases of certain kinds of bases, so let's take, for example, lye. If you had a lye, you can get as a solid, if you had lye and you put it on your skin and you made like a paste of it with water, it would start to react with your skin very, very quickly. And it would get into these other phases much faster than if you had just a normal solution like what we use up in lab. Concentration does make a significant difference. Okay, so that's the last general kind of thing that we're going to talk about here. The remainder of this chapter is going to be focusing on very specific but very common reagents and what their specific hazards are and where we might see them used. So we're going to start with sulfuric acid. Again, the thing that's pumping through town consistently on some of those uh, rail cars. Sulfuric acid on itself is a colorless, but kind of oily looking liquid. Its density is nearly double that of water, so about two grams per milliliter. And depending upon its nature, at the industrial grade, it could be clear and colorless. It can have slightly yellow to brown tint in it as well. When it is used up, 
it will degrade into a brownish black kind of solution over time. Now, where do we use it? Why is it so common that we need to have it running through town consistently? Well, it's like I said, there's a lot of uses, practical application and industrial uses for it. As of 2020, we use roughly, we make roughly 40 million tons of sulfuric acid every year. Primary usage, we drove here today, we used sulfuric acid. Lead storage acid, lead acid batteries, use sulfuric acid in those batteries. So your car battery is a lead acid battery, um, which is one of the reasons why you never pop open the battery unless you know for certain that it is cool. Because the, if the engine is hot, the battery is also hot, which means that the sulfuric acid in there is vaporized. If you open it up, it'll shoot up this big plume of sulfuric acid. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt to breathe it in. It's certainly going to hurt on your skin. Where else do we see it? Well, it's used in the manufacture of explosives because it does have a little bit of an oxidizing character to it. Um, it also is used in fertilizers for its sulfur content, in drug making processes. And like I said, there are lots of industrial and commercial compounds and products that use sulfuric acid somewhere in the production process. By law, OSHA requires that the corrosive pictogram appear on every sulfuric acid label. And with good reason. It's very corrosive. It's a very strong acid. It's one of the strongest acids in existence. And it's got some nasty effects if you come into contact with it accidentally. Reactions of sulfuric acid um, can be somewhat um, dangerous. Um, if sulfuric acid reacts with organic materials, it is a very good dehydrating acid, which means that it will pull water out of whatever compound that it is in and do so with a good amount of heat coming off as well. And so I have some videos that I want to show you. Concentrated sulfuric acid is a strong dehydrating agent, which is the reason it is corrosive to living material. One way of writing the formula of table sugar is C12H22O11. Another way to write the formula is C12 and then 11 H2Os as part of the formula. This shows that the carbohydrate is made of carbon and water. Here is some table sugar and here's a bottle of concentrated sulfuric acid. Let me start with some sugar and some of the acid. And now I want to give them a good mix. Watch what happens to the sugar. What's happened to its color? color is changing. Now do you see steam starting to rise from it? I'm going to pause for just for a second. I feel this guy's pain. Um, I've done demonstrations a number of times, and it is always kind of the most mortifying thing to be doing something that you know is supposed to work one way, 
and for whatever reason, it's just acting a little bit slow, and you're just standing there waiting for it to happen. You're, you're having a mini anxiety attack like he is going, okay, I'm on camera. Is this going to work? And that you can see it. He's, he's nervous already, just by the way he's been kind of shuffling around. He's wondering. But anyway, the, the, the big reveal is coming here. The chemical reaction you are seeing is the dehydration of the sugar to water vapor and pure carbon. There is so much energy being released that the water for turns to steam and makes the carbon molecules separate, much like bread rising. The sugar goes to carbon and water vapor and lets off energy. The carbon becomes charcoal. The sulfuric acid evaporates making water vapor and sulfur dioxide molecules. This is a very expensive way of making charcoal. I used about 50 cents worth of sugar and a dollar's worth of sulfuric acid to make less than 50 cents worth of charcoal. Plus, this charcoal isn't dry enough to take and burn immediately. It is. It's not the same. Anything your wild child does. It's not the same kind of reaction, but it is. There's a similar premise there. These snake ones you um, work by, you like put water on them or something, and they, the water kickstarts the chemical reaction, and and it makes some sort of. It, it's like a carbon stick. Right? All right. One other to show you, this one's not nearly as long. Okay. That's unfortunate. It was available on time. <clears throat> um, it's the same kind of reaction. Um, sulfuric acid, um, sponges, natural sponges, or even um, uh, artificial ones are cellulosic, made out of uh, kind of the same material that paper is. And so it eats through the sponge um, in kind of the same way. Um, if you're working with sulfuric acid, any paper products that you have around, if you expose them to sulfuric acid, they will turn black upon contact. Maybe not immediate contact, but certainly within less than a minute of coming into contact with, uh, with concentrated sulfuric acid. And for the same reason, sulfuric acid dehydrates the paper, dehydrates the sponge. And when it dehydrates it, all that's left is carbon. And that carbon is fragile, brittle, and unusable in its, in its present state. And that's where we're going to stop for today.